Talofa, kia ora, a very warm welcome to the Pacific Way. While perhaps not widely understood, sea level monitoring stations provide an important service to Pacific Islanders. The information they provide can greatly impact the development aspirations of Pacific Island countries and territories. Tonight, we get a glimpse of how these vital stations operate by tracking Tuvalu's tides. The nation of Tuvalu is made up of nine low-lying islands scattered across the surface of the equatorial Pacific Ocean. These islands are home to over 11,000 people, and for them, the sea can be a great source of beauty and bounty. But the ebb and flow of the tides has also brought change to these islands. At the wharf in Tuvalu's capital, Funafuti, important maintenance work is underway. This is a sea level monitoring station, one of 13 located throughout the Pacific region. The station here monitors the sea level with three sensors. We've got the, the primary sensor being the aqua track, and the secondary is the Vega sensor, and the tertiary is the pressure sensor the Vega being a radar sensor, and we also have uh, meteorological data with uh, temperatures of in-water temperature, air temperature in a beehive screen, uh, wind, speed and direction, and a barometer. With those sensors we can confirm whether the changes of the sea level is climate uh, orientated or of, of uh, heating of, of the planet, or is it uh, just a weather event in the area that's uh, continued on for some days. Tuvalu has been situated on a low-lying atoll. They uh, see the immediate effects of uh, climate change and uh, on top of the king tides that they get uh, can be quite uh, dangerous for uh, people uh, living in these uh, countries. So by us as a participant in the Pacific area and providing that information, they can then uh, help forecast events and whether they can then create other engineering uh, needs to uh, help stop the, the flow of water into their countries and into their, their housing. On those. The monitoring stations are part of the Australian government funded Pacific Sea Level Monitoring Project. The project is implemented in partnership with the Australian Bureau of Meteorology's Climate and Ocean Support Program, Geoscience Australia, Pacific Island Governments and the Secretariat of the Pacific Community's Applied Geoscience and Technology Division, SOPAC. Whilst other countries or more developed countries in the, in the world have had um, time series data relating to water levels um, spanning many decades, in some cases more than 100 years, there really hasn't been much information available in the Pacific. So having these tight gauges, which, is, which have now been operational for uh, more than two decades, has really filled a critical gap in our understanding of uh, how water level in the oceans change in the Pacific and how these variations uh, impact on the lives of Pacific Islanders and how uh, we can work um, with the sea and better adapt and make our coastal development more resilient. This particular hut has been collecting and analysing vital data for over 20 years and today has earned an upgrade. Um, so what's changed is the data collection platform or the automatic weather station. And we've upgraded the communication system so that we've got real-time comms back to head office and also we don't rely on the mains being available. We run on solar power with a big bank of batteries to keep it running for days even if there's no sun and in the case that there's a cyclone or there's overcast conditions for a couple of weeks or something, uh, we have the ability to switch the mains on remotely from Melbourne. Every minute data is relayed back to Australia for analysis, which now also allows for better monitoring of other potential threats like tsunamis. This data is available online to Pacific Islands via a new real-time data link that allows them to see what is happening at any station at a given time. The data is also used to create tidal prediction calendars for each location. On the ground in Tuvalu, this information is very valuable to the Tuvalu Meteorological Service. We issue two forecasts, one in the morning and one in the afternoon, 
so we update the um, the type prediction so we use we mostly rely on the the uh, type prediction that from the that been um, analyzed and been produced from the the tie gauge mm -hmm. for us um, anything above around 2.93 meters prediction we sort of mark that that to make sure that's insert into the information that we put up in the in our forecast for to the public we usually during spring tides experience a flooding however when it started like middle 1990s it was like puddles you know quite small and they, they only occur january february and march however there is a great change now you can see uh, the high tides occurring in other months high tide inundation where the actual land the low-lying areas on the land are being underwater and the area that is covered has been increasingly uh, widespread and uh, i would say it's just more like a lake rather than a puddle being able to better predict and prepare for the extreme high tides can help prevent great loss to personal property. But other vital services also depend on the information provided by the sea level monitoring station. That is the most important data in my office. Usually I plan the network plan for our cables. And uh, as you know that uh, Funafuti is experiencing um, high tide um, season mostly every month and uh, this is where and the most affected area is where our underground infrastructures are there so usually this is a very ongoing uh, problem to us with our office telecom and uh, that's why I need this data because if it's high diet and I can see that our infra infrastructures are very affected underground by this tides coming underground and it's affected all our cables and our assets around that area. Uh, the Met office has been a very important person to my project and also to other climate change officers. We never miss him out in our discussion. Is uh, Tawala Katea. He is always invited to any of the uh, workshop or training we train to the community, not only to the community but also to schools. Every training that we had, I always uh, hear him uh, talking about the device that is uh, located at the wharf and how important the device is and how what other information are collected from those uh, from that device. One of the best known products of the sea level monitoring project are annual tide calendars. These are published for all sites around the region and include moon phases as well as highest monthly and annual tide predictions. I've been to all the countries in the Pacific, uh, Northern and the Southern Pacific uh, uh, countries, they mostly use this as for their fisheries, you know, the normal people. And it's funny when we attend to their country, they only know of the calendars, the tide calendars, and they, they never knew that from those tide station data, we managed to do the prediction for, the, for those tide data. So when they found out, you know, they were quite keen to help in any way because they know it's quite important for them. Not only the people living in that country, it's also SOPEC staff uses that tide data. So for example, we just did some work for the ESET uh, program in Kiribati, which we you know, quietly use that data for our tide, uh, low tide, uh, that we can attend to the work that we need to do. And yeah, of course it is quite important for a lot of people in the country, and especially when you know, the ports now they access the data in real time. You know, when they bought the boats, uh, big boats comes in for, they need to know the wind speed and wind direction at that time. They can access those data and it's quite important. On the international arena, Tuvalu and neighboring Kiribati are among the biggest ambassadors lobbying for greater global assistance in combating climate change and sea level rise. 
Pepituola Tassi is a climate change officer with the Department of Environment, and part of her work involves international negotiations on the Climate Change Convention. Before you go and talk in the international arena, you, know to, you need to know um, exactly what's happening at, um, at the national level in the country. It's the only um, service that gives us the data um, that can uh, provide us some substantial information of what's really happening uh, with the climate. As a party to the Convention of Climate Change at the UNFCCC, um, Tuvalu is obliged to report, like to do its national communications. And in the national communication is where one of the, the chapter is looking at vulnerability uh, assessments. So where that's when we very much rely on the data from the Met service to give us that information and then run into models and look at the different scenarios that we can use to project what's going to happen in the future. We bring the students to, to see in reality the instruments that are being used and they have also talked about in their science subjects. Surely it is an important part because they have to save themselves in, just in the near future because Tuvalu is one of the vulnerable countries in the world today. To me it's a very important thing for them to know so that they can look after the device as well because they are the ones who are interested to uh, swim at the wharf so it's important for them how to know to look after the device because the device is a very important uh, uh, tool for collecting information not only for the MET but for the whole of Tuvalu. Tuvaluans continue to resiliently adapt to the challenges around them, safeguarding the tools that aid in better understanding and anticipating the changing tides around them could very well mean safeguarding the future of these shores. Welcome back. This year marks the United Nations International Year of Small Island Developing States, or SIDS. And in September, the Pacific shared in celebrating and congratulating the independent state of Samoa for successfully hosting the third United Nations SIDS conference. Held every 10 years, the conference provides a vital platform for SIDS around the world to discuss common challenges and the means of addressing them. Among the many important issues discussed was the burden of non-communicable diseases, or NCDs. This next story highlights how Pacific SIDS in particular are looking to address the NCD burden. Banding together for a united voice, over 450 young people from the Pacific, Caribbean, Atlantic, Indian Ocean, Mediterranean and South China Sea regions gathered for the Talavo Youth Forum in Apia, Samoa on Thursday 28 August 2014. The purpose, to discuss the priorities they intended to take forward into the meetings and events at the Small Islands Developing States SIDS Conference which was being hosted in Samoa from the 1st to the 4th of September. During discussions with the Youth Forum delegates on issues of health and non-communicable diseases NCDs, social development, youth and disability, the Secretariat of the Pacific Community SPC's Director General, Dr. Colin Tukuitonga, paid particular attention to the NCD crisis in the Pacific and the need for NCD prevention measures to focus on youth. And for the first time in our history as a region, we're producing children generation of young people who are the most obese than ever before and it's quite possible that we will see in this generation children dying before their parents. Over 75 percent of deaths in the Pacific region are NCD related, most of which are premature. And as a result, these largely preventable diseases drastically impact national development efforts. 
Given the fact that half of the Pacific's population is under 25 years old, emphasis needs to focus on prevention, particularly in supporting the healthy lifestyles for children and youth. We've had issues with depopulation for a long time. So if we have young people uh, who have NCDs, and uh, they may end up uh, having to leave the island to find uh, medical attention in New Zealand because we don't have things like, uh, if you need to go on dialysis, you'll have to go to New Zealand. So our productive workforce will be gone, and uh, that's also a brain drain on the island. So these are some of the additional things that our leaders will need to think about and plan for. We talk about uh, HIV or some disease that we hear from other countries, but uh, NCD is right on our doorstep and, and it's, it's not something that is, is brought from outside. Like we keep blaming the tourism and uh, people coming in, but NCD is, is right there and we are, we are the, um, the very ones that be, can be blamed for that. So uh, in our countries, that, that, is, that is very relevant, uh, just as uh, any other development issues that we have whether you talk about employment or uh, health or some other, NCD is, is at the top of the list as well, uh, if you want to address sustainable development. In the Pacific, specifically, NCD is um, starting to uh, be, become recognized as a major issue for, for young people as well. As today, during one of discuss, our discussions for the issues in the Pacific, some young people mentioned uh, child obesity as an as a issue in the Pacific. So I do believe that it is an important um, uh, health issue that we need to um, consider and also needs to be included in, um, in the outcomes document for, for the youth. Current efforts to tackle the NCD crisis are not enough. That was a clear message by the SPC's Director General to those present at the Multi-Stakeholder Partnership Dialogue on Social Development in Small Island Developing States, Health and Non-Communicable Diseases, Youth and Women at the third SIDS conference. Or oh, imagine trying to empty the Pacific Ocean with a teaspoon. Because that, that's what we are doing. In other words, there's a lot of commitment, uh, fantastic political leadership in this region, but we are not uh, making the impact on the ground. NCDs threaten Pacific SIDS achieving their development goals, and despite a lot being done to address the crisis, the battle is far from over. The NCDs are responsible for eight out of every ten deaths in the Pacific and account for 75 to 85 percent of total deaths in the Caribbean. This high prevalence can be partly explained by the transition, and it's been a fast transition, from traditional low-fat diets to energy-dense, nutrient-poor ones, high tobacco use and low levels of physical activity. In response to the mammoth task at hand, the Pacific NCD Partnership for a Multi-Sector Approach to Prevent and Control NCDs was launched by the President of Palau and current Chair of the Pacific Islands Forum. Our current approach involving all the sectors needs to be strengthened, particularly in addressing the social determinants of health and strengthening the health systems. Madam Chairperson, Taking into account this growing movement, it is therefore with great pleasure that as the current chair of the Pacific Island Forum, I hereby launch the Pacific NCD Partnership for a multi-sector approach to prevent and control NCDs. There are some very important contributors that are not already uh, participating. If you think about PIFs, they're the people that decide the trade policies around the region. And trade, uh, particularly in food and highly processed food, uh, is clearly relevant to discussion. To the discussion. The other is uh, UNDP. They do a lot of social development issues and they need to be involved. Uh, and then the civil society, the NCD Alliance, for example. So we need to broaden the uh, contributors and build a, a genuine, truly inclusive uh, arrangement for the region.
The journey is a long one, but with the NCD partnership, it is envisioned that Pacific SIDS stand a better chance of halting and eventually reversing the NCD's crisis. Unfortunately, we've run out of time and we leave you with the traditional Chamorro performance from Guam. A quick reminder, Pacific Way is also online, so do drop us a line on Facebook or check us out on YouTube. We'd love to hear from you. Until next week, Nisa Mode, Fuomos.